Okay, so this is a presentation I gave in uh, Edinburgh uh, about a month ago. Um, so I started out by thanking everybody. Uh, so I thanked Laura who invited me, and I thanked the audience for their uh, attention, hopefully. And then I, I, th I, I made a joke, which was, and I wanted to thank them for scaring Noel into getting a bunch of data to me in the past week and a half. And then I said, no, I'm just kidding. She's great. Um, and I said, because it turns out when you tell your second year grad student that uh, you're going to present their work in front of Laura Ross and the Charlesworths, uh, that suddenly uh, things become urgent. OK, so you all have probably seen this from me. Um, so what do I mean by molecular weirdness? Uh, so this is a famous quote from Potter Stewart. I shall not today try uh, attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. Uh, and perhaps I can never see it and intelligibly do so, but I know it when I see it. Um, which is actually a quote from a, uh, the famous um, 1964 case, case defining what pornography is in America. Um, so, uh, I don't I, sorry, I haven't given this presentation in a while. And I, said, I think I said something like, so until recently it looked like this was going to be um, my gravestone. Um, and, but uh, I've gotten interested in some other things. So, um, but in case anybody showed up today hoping that the presenter might talk about something he knew something about, let me give you my four minute summary on what we've been up to on introns. Um, so here we have a depiction of intron structures from humans, cerevisiae and prokaryotes. Um, and you see uh, these differences where in prokaryotes there are no Splicesomal type introns or anything similar. And then in cerevisiae, they're very rare. And then in humans, you have a bunch of them, and they're huge, and you have two different classes. Um, and so what we've been going after is sort of all the obvious questions that, that arise from that. Um, so who, what, where, when, why. Um, so who. So it turns out that most eukaryotes have quite a lot of introns. The yeast uh, are actually weird. Um, and when did this occur? We now have good evidence that introns arose early in the eukaryotic common ancestor. And since then, there have been occasional bursts of intron gain. How? So recently, Jason Huff had a nice paper showing that um, in many ways, it seems like lucky transposable elements that acquire splicing signals can spread through the genome and create new introns. So it seems like this sort of just fluke event of the evolution of a, a spliceable transposon that can spread. Uh, and so then, why? So this, you all have heard me go through this more times than I need to. This was for the benefit of all the population geneticists there. Um, and and this, this bit, so one, at some point I had thought that this would be my big coming out party uh, in terms of showing the tests we've been up to about Mike Lynch's stuff. Um, but instead I, I, I sort of limited it to this. So that there's no evidence for that differences in population size uh, are driving differences in intron exon structures. We don't see increase in intron numbers in vertebrates. We don't see an increase in the animal ancestor. We don't see an increase in regions of, re of re recombination recombi suppression. We don't see increase in small linea any lineages in general. And instead, it sort of looks more like luck that those uh, lineages that have the right mutations uh, either gain a lot of introns or lose a lot of introns. And then finally, what? So one thing we've been doing is um, uh, going around the eukaryotic tree of life and finding um, all kinds of cool structural novelties associated with splicing. Um, we've also been working on minor spliceosomal introns. Um, and so what are these? This is a parallel system uh, with, with a whole different machinery and different splicing signals um, with only, they're, they're infrequent in the genome, that's why they're called minor, uh, with only a handful to maybe about a thousand of them, um, except for the last line of the slide. Uh, who has them? So many eukaryotic lineages, but then many have lost them. When did they arise? Uh, early in the origins of eukaryotes. Um, and we have some evidence that they were more abundant in early eukaryotes. Uh, and in fact, we're working to use this, these early elements to try to order events in the origin of eukaryotes. Um, and so why are there? We've been looking into alternative splicing. Um, and we have some cool cases where we have competition between the splicing machineries probably working as a regulatory mechanism. So to, just an aside, uh, yeah, that's sort of a funny thing that I don't actually think that we have evidence, nor do I believe that that's a general question, why, like, that this is a general why, but you know, in my sort of four minute summary, I chose to do that. But that's a decision I made and sort of a funny one because it implies that I'm saying something general when I'm not actually trying to. But 
Uh, and then and then we have another what um, with more punctuation. Um, this is Graham's work, as we all know, um, that we have the slime mold that has a transform minor system with about 15,000 newly gained introns. Um, so I, I, people have seen this before, so I'm going to skip over this. I talked about trans, uh, briefly about transplicing in Giardia, and then I made my, my joke that we then went in and looked at the transcriptome, and in the whole transcriptome, millions of reads, we found exactly one more case, which is good because that allowed me to publish it. <laughs> and then I talked about translation in Giardia, um, and, I taught, and, and so then I said, so that's what I've been up to for most of my career, but this sort of interest in weird molecules has sort of expanded recently. We've been doing some work, um, the model for me on the right, uh, in terms of the, the origins of this weird scrambling of the genome in ciliates. Um, and then I said, uh, and this paper has nothing to do with me except for it's my friends. I just think it's an awesome paper that everybody should know about, where they found this species, um, which has uh, no normal stop codon in translation termination is context dependent. Hey, sorry. I think you heard me. Okay, sorry. Cool. Okay, and but the, the main the main new set of weird molecules that we've gotten interested in is um, is uh, sex determination and sex chromosomes. Um, so what we have here is some some of Laura's work. Uh, and with the tree of sex consortium, and what we see, uh, these are all different colors represent different um, different forms of sex determination. Red is an X Y or X O system. Blue is a Z W system, and so forth. Uh, and what we see is this huge diversity across eukaryotes. And so we've gotten interested in sort of why do we see this diversity, and how how does this diversity um, evolve? So I want to talk to you today about three things. Um, first is using complex sex chromosomal systems. Uh, as simple and simplified natural experience, experiments. Um, the second question is why does haplodiploidy evolve? Uh, and the third is insights from the genome of a sexually weird mammal. So X chromosomes um, have uh, been really useful. Evolution is hard to study basically because it's slow. So um, we need natural experiments in which evolution has assigned different entities, species or genes or whatever to different conditions. So the genes on the X chromosome are a really good example of that. Um, because the X chromosome just evolved from kind of a random autosome. So it's basically the X chromosome is essentially a quasi-random se uh, selection of genes uh, that have been um, randomly assigned uh, to this, this different evolutionary and transmissional environment. And so studies from people in this room and elsewhere, this room being Edinburgh, um, have shown um, uh, uh, working on X chromosomes, um, have reached many important contributions, that many beneficial mutations are recessive, that many beneficial mutations are sexually antagonistic, for instance, that they're favored in, in females or disfavored in males, um, and that effective population size is an important determinant of genetic diversity. And so these, um, so what I'm going to do now is back up and sort of go through um, differences between the X chromosomes and autosomes um, to sort of discuss how this works, and then talk about our system. So take a minute to, to orient yourselves here. This is, this is going to be my schema. Um, so what we're talking about here is the, the first, the initial zygote, the fertilized zygote, and to the left, the somatic uh, tissues, and to the right, um, gametogenesis from the diploid stage of gametogenesis to the, the haploid gametes, um, with females on the top and males on the bottom. Um, and so what we're looking at here is sort of a normal XY system. Um, and I just want to point out uh, that often you, you also have lots of systems where they're identical, but they don't have a Y chromosome. And so instead you end up with gametes that either bear, the sperm that either bear an X or don't. And so when we look at this, we see basically two kinds of differences between autosomes and X chromosomes. So um, the first one is uh, that the X chromosome, unlike the autosomes, is hemizygous some of the time, that, that it's, it's present in males uh, in a single copy, which allows recessive mutations to um, be fully expressed. Um, and then the second one is differences in transmission. So these we can see on the right-hand side of the, the figure. Uh, and we see a few differences here, right? So the first one is that in the population, because some gametes uh, lack X, lack an X that are actually the, the different that X's have a different effective population size. The number of 
allele, X alleles in a population is smaller than on the autosomes. Um, also, we see that X is more frequently inherited from females because all eggs, but only half of sperm, bear an X. Um, and this, this has a few consequences, including uh, less mutation overall, since spermatogenesis seems to be more mutagenic than is oogenesis. Um, and, uh, and then also more the stronger selection, more frequent selection on females than in males, because two thirds of the time that the X chromosome is under selection, it's under selection in males. And so let's go through uh, a couple of the consequences of these. So first thing um, would be uh, recessive mutations. So let's imagine a mutation that occurs, a recessive mutation that occurs uh, on an autosome. And what we're looking at here is just a population of individuals. You can see males and females. Um, and I've left out the Y because we don't care about it. Um, and so if this mutation arises on the autosome and is recessive, well, when it's rare, um, it's going to mostly be in heterozygotes. And therefore, it's not going to have an effect on fitness. So that allele may spread through the population somewhat, but if so, it would just sort of be by drift um, because it can't gain um, any selection. It can't confer a benefit because it's recessive. And so over time, we expect it to um, drift out of the population, as do most mutations. Uh, by contrast, if uh, this mutation occurs on the, the X, well, sometimes it will have the, sim the same problem of being covered up. Uh, but occasionally, it will be found in males, one third of the time. And when it is, it will confer a fitness benefit to those males, um, which will allow it to spread through the population um, and uh, gaining a benefit when it's in males, um, allowing it to, to spread through the population and fix. And so this is just a, a sort of cartoon of this notion that recessive beneficial mutations uh, are going to be much more likely to spread when they're on, when, uh, if they're on the X chromosome than if they're on, the, on autosomes. And so this could lead to faster X evolution. Okay, so uh, a second of the uh, fundamental modes of analysis here um, can be seen in terms of uh, different effects on males and females. So now we're not talking about a recessive allele. Let's just talk about a, an additive allele that's neither recessive nor dominant. Um, so if we imagine a mutation that's on the autosomes that is really good in females but really bad in males. So here's our... On the top, we have our, our first our current generation and the bottom, our second generation. Um, so if we think about that, so the mutation when in females um, is, let's say, is very strongly beneficial, uh, leading this female to have two, two offspring. Um, and here again, we have that this one is very beneficial, leading to an additional two offspring. But let's say, by contrast, this allele is really bad in males. Um, so that means that this individual does not leave any offspring and this individual does not leave any offspring. So what we have is basically uh, twice it makes, it, makes it, it increases fitness by a factor of two in females and destroys fitness in males. So a very extreme example, but this is a cartoon after all. And so what, what that means is that these two things are going to ba balance out the stronger fitness in males, uh, sorry, females. And the, and the lack of fitness in males are going to balance out. And if we start with four, uh, four copies of the allele uh, in this population, then under this cartoon, we would expect four, four individuals carrying the allele in the next population. So that the two cancel each other out. However, if we instead um, imagine a mutation on the X chromosome that is similarly good in females, bad in males, well, now two thirds of these are going to be in females. And so the doubling that we get uh, in females is going to more than outweigh the halving that we get in males. And so we would expect then an increase um, for, in, in chromosome, in copy number of this allele of, in frequency from generation to generation. Um, and so this is basically a cartoon of the notion that sexually antagonistic mutations, those that are good in females but not in males, can spread on the X um, but not on autosomes. So yes, this is only under certain conditions. But the, I believe that this cartoon does basically show the underlying idea there. OK, so in general, um, the way that science works is we start with some hypothesis, uh, which makes a prediction. Um, and then we test to see if that prediction is fulfilled. Um, so we have a hypothesis that makes a prediction. And then we look to see if the prediction is fulfilled. Um, if it is, we'd like to do uh, this and turn around the arrow and say that our prediction 
um, supports our hypothesis. Um, the problem, of course, is that we can have an alternative hypothesis which makes the same fulfilled prediction, um, which means that this prediction is not, uh, now does not allow us to distinguish between these two hypotheses. And therefore, we can't uh, fully evaluate our hypothesis. And so we see this happening a lot um, in the field of X chromosome, the study of X chromosomes in, in evolution. So we said, I went through an argument for why hemizygosity may promote faster X evolution. And then we look and we do find that there's faster X evolution. However, there are other reasons that we could expect that transmission would lead to faster, faster X evolution. Therefore, the observation of faster X evolution um, is not sufficient for us to conclude, uh, to, to draw this important general conclusion. And so it's just worth pointing out um, that these, these two hypotheses would lead us to very different conclusions. The two reasons that we predict faster X um, would lead us to very different conclusions. If this is why, then we would conclude that many beneficial mutations are recessive, whereas if this is why, um, we would conclude that many beneficial mutations are sexually antagonistic to fundamentally different inferences about evolution. Um, another thing, another observation is that there's lower diversity on the X, um, which has been attributed to transmissional differences, in particular to lower po affected population size. And if you look, you do in find fact that in fact find that. Um, however, there's other reasons, um, such as hemizygosity, or sorry, other reasons due to hemizygosity that we might expect this result. So again, these two things lead us; these two ideas lead us to very different conclusions about the nature of evolution, and so it's important to distinguish them. We have a similar thing with uh, higher codon bias on the X, with two different possibilities. So what I want to talk to you uh, about today is uh, Noel's work looking at um, two strange groups of dipterans, of flies, gall midges, and black fungus gnats. So to orient you again, here's our, um, our standard uh, AA, sorry, our standard male hetero, heterogametic um, life stage diagram. Um, so now let's introduce you to the state, the a simplified version of what we see in these two groups. So the first thing is that there are no differences in females. Females look just like normal. Males are where things get weird. So to start out with, um, males begin life like females with two X chromosomes. Um, however, one of them is jettisoned early in development to give rise to the classic single X um, karyotype. In gametogenesis, then, um, there's, a, there's jettisoning of the entire, uh, of the entire uh, paternally inherited genome here in blue. Sorry, I should have said that before. Um, the entire paternally inherited uh, chromosome leading again to um, uh, all gametes having Xs, which then can explain why all zygotes start with two Xs. Um, and so we can call this uh, PXE PGE, PGE, the standard paternal genome elimination, and PXE, um, elimination of this X. So calling this PXE, this PGE, so together PXE, PGE. So if we think about our two differences, so um, we have our, our somatic differences, uh, differences in hemizygosity, and we see that those do, in fact, occur in our PXE, PGE system, um, but that our transmissional differences do not occur because now um, autosomes and X chromosomes are transmitted identically. So we have, tr we have hemizygosity differences, but not transmission differences between the X and the A in, the, in these systems. Just like I said. And so now this means that under these systems, we can, um, we can use this to disentangle whether hemizygosity or transmission differences um, are driving the effect. If we see a given effect in PXE PGE, then it must be due to hemizygosity, not transmission, because the transmission differences don't apply. If instead um, transmission is what's causing a given effect, um, then we would expect to see it in PXE PGE. Sorry, we would not expect to see it in PXE PGE. Um, so Noel's been studying available data from the Hessian fly, and I'd like to talk, talk to you some about that, those results. So the first question is, do we see higher codon bias on the X um, and so we do, 
in fact see sorry it's been a bit um, s yes so for two different measures um, we see a differences between X's and autosomes um, in each case um, consistent with higher codon bias um, on the X chromosome than on autosomes um, suggesting that hemizygosity is contributing to differences in uh, codon bias on the X uh, not just transmission differences um, the second one is whether we see more male bias genes on the X um, and so here we're looking at male bias genes on the bottom and we see that indeed we do see more uh, male bias genes on the X than on, um, than on autosomes um, again suggesting that hemizygosity is playing a role in um, biasing the X chromosome towards, towards male bias genes what about female bias genes? So here, I thought I had another figure. Um, we do not see that difference um, where we see, we actually see, if anything, more female bias genes on autosomes. But if you sort of get rid of the male bias ones, it gets pretty close to each other. So this suggests, in fact, that it's not hemizygosity, but rather transmissional differences um, that have been driving female biased genes on the X. Um, and then fi finally, faster X evolution. And here I gave like, four different caveats for why this isn't done yet. And then after, and despite that, um, after at the end of the seminar during the questions, Brian Charlesworth raised his hand and said, are you really confident in those results from the faster X? And I said, no, no, Brian, I'm not. Good point. So we don't at this point see differences um, in DNDS. Interestingly, we see, do see differences in DS and in DN, um, in, where we actually see uh, lower rates of change on the X chromosome than on autosomes, and we don't know why that is. Um, we're still thinking about that. Uh, and so the next thing that we are working on um, is looking on diversity at the X chromosome and autosomes. Um, we have those ready for sequencing, and uh, as of yesterday, I can say uh, Brad Bowser, a student in the lab, is working on getting that stuff sequenced. Brad did not smile when I said that. Mm. <laughs> Uh, so our conclusions then um, are as follows. Greater codon bias on the X and M destructor uh, indicates that hemizygosity uh, leads to increases in selective efficiency. Um, excess male bias expression on the X um, leads to, and I could have done this better. So the first one would have been uh, that hemizygosity increases selection against deleterious mutations. The next one would be hemizygosity increases um, the success of beneficial mutations. Um, third, no excess of female bias genes, suggesting that many mutations are sexually antagonistic, and that's why we see uh, female biased Xs in other species. And finally, no faster X evolution, um, which would suggest that increased adaptation um, may not underlie the faster X effect. Okay, so then uh, next I'd like to talk um, about this question close to Laura's heart about why does haplodiploidy evolve, um, again, using our system? So here we have normal on the top, and we have a sort of standard haplodiploid or paternal genome elimination system on the bottom. Some of you will be familiar with this. Uh, so under um, haplodiploidy, uh, or under paternal elimination, um, what we see is fairly standard um, somatic development, um, but then loss of the X chromosome, uh, sorry, loss of the paternally inherited genome uh, prior to spermatogenesis. Um, I don't have anything after the M. Um, in some cases, that uh, auto, those autosomes are, uh, sorry, the genome is silenced uh, in the soma, uh, which is why I have it in parentheses. And in addition, in haplodiploidy, um, that, that paternal genome is not eliminated, it's just never there. We have de development from uh, haploid eggs. So it's worth pointing out that this is kind of all over the place. So this is uh, within arthropods. Um, and bl uh, green here is haplodiploidy. And you can see it's present in an entire uh, class of animals um, and that it's evolved many different times in, in various different lineages. So why does this evolve? So um, some of the early theory on this uh, that Haplodiploidy allows increased transmission of maternal genes, basically because the maternal genes in sons don't have to compete with paternal genes for transmission. That is, under haplodiploidy or paternal genome elimination, 
a female's sons all transmit her genes. So insofar as mothers can control this phenomenon, there's a strong benefit to having a uh, haplodiploidy or paternal genome elimination. Um, a second is that it allows for maternal control of sex ratio um, because m under, the, under this, uh, a female can determine, um, can control how many of her eggs are fertilized so that she can determine how many of them will develop as, as males and how many of them will develop as females. Um, and finally, uh, this allows um, evolution, so you can evolve uh, to direct, sorry, because fertilization is not necessary for, um, for development, um, this allows reproduct this ensures reproductive success because even females uh, who cannot find mating partners can reproduce. So then, given all these great things about haplodiploidy and paternal genome elimination, um, we could, another, the, maybe the question we should be asking is, why doesn't PG, PGE always evolve? Why aren't mammals P, uh, PGE or haplodiploid? So, probably the most important thinking on this question comes from, uh, from Laura and her collaborators. Um, and what they did here uh, was they looked at um, they, they looked at a database that Heath has um, of karyotypes from different organisms from different from different insects. And so our, uh, w what they found, um, sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit. I haven't done this in a while. Um, what they found is that there was a correlation between there being a large X chromosome and the evolution of haplodiploidy. So they looked at many different independent evolution, uh, origins of haplodiploidy and found that it tends to evolve when you have a large X chromosome. Okay, so now we have an effect. We have a prediction. We have a, a relationship. And the question is, why do we have this relationship? Well, their, uh, their hypothesis, what drew, drove them to do this, was as follows. Um, so they argued that, um, so we have the autosomes on top. So that would be all autosomes in the, in the genome kind of all hooked together in one big autosome, and then on the bottom, the X chromosome. So what they argued is basically autosomes have a lot more recessive deleterious mutations that are segregating um, because they're always present in two copies. Um, and so what that means then is that uh, when we start from a diploid state and then we evolve to a haplodiploid state, that these males, these, these newly haploid males, have all these recessive deleterious alleles um, in them and therefore are going to have low fitness. By contrast, if we have a large X chromosome, then most of the genome has already been evolving uh, in part under hemizygosity and so should have purged these recessive deleterious mutations. Um, and so now we have far fewer uh, recessive deleterious mutations and we expect newly haploid males um, to have greater fitness overall. And so that would may, mean basically that under this hypothesis, the reason that large X chromosomes lead to haplodiploidy is because under a large X, we have fewer segregating recessive deleterious variants, um, which means there's a low, lower cost to the evolution of haploidy, which can uh, lead to evolution of haplodiploidy or, or PGE. But there's another possibility for what's going on here, and this comes from David Haig as well as others, um, which is, uh, which sees a strong role for intragenomic conflict uh, in the evolution of haplodiploidy and PGE. Um, so, under um, a standard system, in the absence of meiotic drive, um, male heterogametic systems, that is X, XY or XO systems, um, ensure production of half males and half females, right? Because all that matters is whether you inherit uh, a sperm uh, bearing a Y um, or a sperm bearing an X. However, under meiotic drive, um, the X chromosomes can drive against Y chromosomes, uh, for instance, by killing off uh, Y bearing sperm. Uh, and under these circumstances, you end up with skewed sex ratios. Um, under skewed sex ratios, there's selection um, for conversion of genetic females into males because um, 
under skewed sex ratios, this male will have four times the average fitness as these females, um, which leads to selection for new factors that lead to lead genetic females to develop as males. And so this would suggest another possibility um, is that we have a driving X chromosome, uh, which could lead to selection for a new sex determination mechanism, which after uh, a series of steps could lead to haplodiploidy. And so let me acknowledge that I'm ignoring a lot of things here. We've been working on a model for this, and uh, uh, David Haig has a nice model as well. So then under those circumstances, it might be the case that having a larger X chromosome um, would strengthen this effect, basically strengthening um, the probability that you get an X drive system, basically because the more of your genes are selected, the more of your genes benefit from a driving X, um, the more likely it is, the, 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 the more frequent we expect mutations that lead to X drive to be. Um, and so now we have our two competing hypotheses. On the top, we have uh, our intragenomic co conflict hypothesis, and on the bottom, we have our recessive deleterious variant hypothesis. And what we can note is that one of these has to do with the transmission effects of PGE, um, the, the competition over... Um, over gametogenesis. Um, and at the bottom, we have a somatic hypothesis uh, that basically the, the hemizygosity is what's important here. And so again, um, we can use, so, so if we look, we can, we can show that uh, by comparing HD or PGE systems to normal systems where we see differences in the soma because the, if this, this paternal chromosome, if present, is often silenced. Um, and the differences in transmission with the autosomal, with, with the maternal genome being transmitted to all progeny. Um, and so again, now the difference is that the, the fact that PGE, um, that PXE PGE has transmissional differences but does not have uh, zygosity differences um, means that again, um, we would expect that the transmission hypothesis should pertain here, but not the somatic hypothesis. Because there are, because of these, the transi transmissional change, because of the transmissional change in evolution, in evolving from normal to PXE-PGE, uh, because there is a transmissional change, that would mean that this hypothesis should, should hold, um, but this one across the bottom should not because there's no somatic difference. Right? Um, let me just say that one more time. Um, in the evolution of PXE PGE, we do not expect that there are new segregating recessive alleles uncovered because we keep the second chromosome expressed, the second autosome expressed. Therefore, um, if that's what was driving this relationship between large X and haplodiploidy, we would not expect to see that relationship um, in these groups. So, in short, the transmission hypothesis predicts that the large X should facilitate the evolution of PXE PGE, whereas the somatic hypothesis does not predict that. So we sequenced a bunch of individuals um, from this larger, uh, this larger superfit family. In red are our two groups that show PXE PGE, and then in black are the others. And we got almost all the superfamilies. This is a collaboration with Jan Sevcik, whose whose work this tree actually comes from. So um, what we did was following Beatrice Picoso's work, who trained here in Edinburgh, um, which takes advantage of the case that um, syntony is conserved over long distances in evolution. So by syntony, I mean that there are a block of genes, basically each arm of the chromosome. An arm of the chromosome in Melanogaster will have stayed as a coherent arm of the chromosome throughout dipter and evolution. Um, so that if two, gene, if two genes are on this red chromosome in Melanogaster, then those two genes will also be together on the same chromosome way out here in other species. And so that's what we're, what we're looking at here. So this is um, two, the two different of these elements named after uh, the great fly geneticist Muller. Um, the showing here is that the homologs stay together, that basically the, the, the Willistoni B has the same genes as the Melanogaster B, the Willistoni C has the same genes 
as uh, the melanogaster C. So this allows us to, um, to make inferences about what the sex chromosomes are um, by, uh, even with, in the absence of very good data, um, just by looking at the coverage. Um, and so here is some work from uh, Beatrice Ficoso and Doris Backdrop, both of whom trained here in, in Edinburgh, um, uh, showing the different XY uh, linkage across this group. So the way that this works is their protocol is we're going to do genomic sequencing of males and females. Um, then we do a preliminary low quality genome assembly. Then we assign each of those um, chunks of genome uh, to Muller groups. Um, just using TBLAST-N against uh, D. melanogaster proteins, um, and then compare the coverage in males and females. Um, if it's on the autosomes, then we expect coverage to be roughly equal, whereas if it's on the X, X chromosome, we expect it will be half, that coverage will be half in males as what it is in females. So the only problem here is um, that in these lineages, it's actually hard to collect females. So all we have is males, um, and so we don't, that we expect the data to be a little bit noisier, uh, but we figured we'd go ahead and give it a shot anyway. And so here's the data. Um, so what we're looking at here is on the on the y-axis is coverage and, and these um, these are non-normalized. So so Noel got got me these right like the morning I gave this talk. So they're not particularly uh, particularly polished, but they still tell a story. And so for instance, what we see here, we can see that this this F element is at lower coverage. This is just the, the amount of DNA, the read coverage. Um, and we see that it's, that it's lower for the F than it is for the others. So this is, um, this is comforting because the F chromosome is, um, is, the X chromo is known to be the ancestral X chromosome in dipterans and remains the X chromosome in a lot of species. And so if we look across, what we see is that um, for a lot of these species, we see a clear uh, or at least clearish um, reduction on the F relative to the autosomes. Um, and let me also say that uh, an another improvement that Noel has made since this talk is um, on these axes, so that these axes are now in base 10. And so under base 10, then the difference in uh, like a, a one half difference in fold coverage or a two fold difference in coverage uh, corresponds to like 0.15 in different or something like that. Um, so now she's done them in. Um, in base two, so under that, it's a, it's the difference in coverage should be one. Um, so what we see is that in many of these species, we have the F, F, the Muller F appears to be the X chromosome, and if we look at them on um, on our tree, so this is all the species that we sequenced, uh, they we see that we kind of, they kind of find all over the place, and interestingly, uh, they are almost exactly opposite the groups that have our uh, that have the PGE PXE. So um, it's Muller F is the X chromosome everywhere except for uh, our two groups of interest. Okay, so, and if we look at this one, so this one species, the one exception to that association, uh, appears not to have evidence for any X chromosome. It seems like everything is present pretty much at the same level. In fact, the F might be a little bit higher, but we don't see any chromosomes that are lowered. So it seems to be the case that there's no X chromosome in Sumeris. Uh, which is precedented, um, but still quite interesting and worth looking into. So next we can look at, my, uh, at M destructor, where we actually have a better uh, assembled genome. And so this, this kind of serves as a, um, a positive control for us. Um, and what we see is that the C, D, and F are, are low relative to A and B, and e, e is kind of intermediate. Um, and this is so exactly what we see that C, D, and F, and part of E, it appears to be the case, um, are X-linked in M destructor. So we can look at our other two in the same family, and again we see um, A and B are higher with, actually I don't know about E there. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll see. Um, so maybe C, D, and F in Lestremia, um, and then this one is, is a little bit messier, um, but again sort of still consistent with A, B, A and B being the highest. So C, D, E and F. Um, so this would mean that we, that it would appear to be the case that, that at the point where this evolved, that we had this X chromosome consisting of four of our six chunks of genes. So that would mean about roughly about 60% of genes on, in the genome uh, being X-linked at the time that this evolved. Okay, what about at the top here? So 
here we see a very different pattern. We see that F is not, does not have uh, low coverage. In fact, it, it seems to be among the highest, and it seems to be the A and E groups um, that, are, that are lower. So we, it appears to be the case that the A and E may be the X chromosomes in these two species. Um, and so again, we infer that there's an AE present in the ancestor. Um, so uh, this is still quite preliminary, um, but it looks promising. So then what are we seeing? What we are seeing is, yes, in fact, when the PXE, PGE evolves, that does seem to be in the context of a large X, which would suggest that it might be the transmission hypothesis, the intragenomic conflict hypothesis, that is driving this, this association um, rather than the somatic hypothesis. So after a talk with Laura early today, I realized that there's another possibility of what's going on here, um, which is that it actually might be that, actually this isn't quite right. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, but another possibility that um, I haven't really fully taken on board yet might be that intragenomic conf, well, it's still intragenomic conflict. Like, yeah, okay, I guess I don't have anything to say about it. Um, oh, here's what I have to say. Uh, so far, we've only shown that there's an association. We can't then exclude the hypothesis that PG, XE, PGE is driving the large X rather than the other way around. However, there's one reason to think we might not that expect that to be the case. So um, this would mean basically that PG, PXE, PGE was, was causing growth of the X chromosome. Um, so the way that we think that X chromosomes grow is that autosomes fuse to previously existing sex chromosomes. Um, and we think that that um, is due to the benefits of X linkage for sexually antagonistic mutation. Again, that's from people here in Edinburgh. Um, and as we've said, so that's what thought, and that, and that is thought to be different due to the differences uh, in transmission between X's and autosomes. So therefore, because we don't have um, these transmissional differences under this system, we actually would not expect the X chromosome to, to grow under this system. So actually this potentially allows for a test of this theory, of, of this theory here, which comes from Brian. Um, the only problem being whether we have enough time. But, but the, the question would be whether we can, whether we can see evidence, wh whether, whether we see a lack of XA fusions um, in PGE, PXE systems. So conclusions from the, sec this, from the section. Uh, the fact that large X's leads to the evolution of weird systems uh, might instead reflect genetic conflict rather than purging of recessive alleles. Um, but uh, we still have a couple uh, caveats, including that we only have two data points, and we're working on this stuff. So finally today, I'd like to give you a short, um, tell you a little bit about what we're learning from the sequence genome of a sexually weird mammal. So. turns out to be the case that the origin of the XY system in mammals goes back to the uh, ancestor of marsupials and placentals. That is, um, that all these, pretty much all these, all these species um, have an XY system and it's the same XY system. That they, the, the, the autosome that evolved into an XY pair in this ancestor seems to have stayed content, constant with few fusions uh, and few losses of the system. Um, but interestingly, if we look at the few systems that are exceptional, um, we find that they're all here in these two, uh, out of all mammals, all the known systems are here in these two families of rodents. And so here are a few of them. Um, so we have systems uh, where males and females are both both have the ancestral X chromosome and the Y chromosome has been lost, but they, all, they each have an unpaired copy. We have systems where the, X, where the X chromosome is basically reverted to an autosome, where both males and females have two copies. Uh, and then we have a um, system that I'm going to talk about today. So the way that this works, um, oh, so I'm going to go, I guess I go through a few of these. So uh, in Alobius, so that's the simplest one. So Alobius basically the X chromosome, Alobius tancrii, the X chromosome has basically become an autosome and so now it's just inherited like an autosome. Um, in another species in the same genus, um, Alobius lutescens, um, 
we have, as I mentioned, the system where both males and females have a single X chromosome um, and where uh, spermatogenesis happens normally. And what happens here is um, actually half of progeny, those bearing two Xs and those bearing zero Xs, uh, die, uh, leaving us with um, a normal, uh, leaving us with a uh, universal XO karyotype. I don't know what this slide is supposed to do. Um, so in other species, we see evolution multiple times of this funny case where we have a strange X chromosome that leads to feminization of XY individuals. So we can call this um, X star. And so what we see there is that X star Y individuals develop as females instead of males. And why that's the case, or, or what the selective pressure was for the origin of this allele, um, seems to be as follows. Um, that when these individuals mate with a normal XY male, that one quarter of their progeny lack a y, an X chromosome and therefore lack the essential genes on the X chromosome and therefore die, um, leaving two thirds of surviving offspring to inherit this X, X star chromosome. So this means that because of this, the death of the YY individuals that the X star chromosome drives um, against the Y. It monopolizes the progeny. Um, so notably, this causes a, a female bias sex ratio. Do, 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 do. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say about that. So next, I want to introduce you to the system that we're, the, the last of these systems is the one that we're studying in uh, Microtus oregone, the creeping vole. So this is a somewhat complicated system um, in which, so somatic, somatic uh, development looks normal. Well, actually, that's not even true. Um, so what happens in the system is that the females have an unpaired X, whereas the, the males have, a, have, an, have both X and Y. Um, both males and females undergo this strange non-disjunction early in gametogenesis. So what we have here is um, a single a, a, a cell with an X, a single X chromosome undergoes non-disjunction, producing one cell with an XX and one cell with no X. This cell lacks, um, this cell lacks essential genes and therefore dies. And then this cell lineage gives rise to, um, to eggs all bearing a single X chromosome. Um, in males, a similar thing happens where you have a non-disjunction of the X. However, in this case, the XXY cell lineage dies and only the AAY cell lineage survives, thus giving rise to um, sex chromosome lacking and Y bearing sperm in a 50-50 ratio. Okay, so um, we sought to study this. So we did uh, deep coverage, 10X Illumina sequencing, uh, and then high C to improve scaffolding. Um, uh, in females, the putative X-linked uh, sequence shows half as much co coverage as in autosomes, just as expected. Um, however, when we looked at males, we found a surprising result. So in males, we would have expected um, that the X chromosome would also be only present in half. Um, and yet what we saw that it was, it was equal coverage to autosomes. Um, do, 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 do. And so, so sorry, let me, let me pause and be clear about what I mean here. What I mean by the X linked sequences is the chromosome in our assembly that is homologous to the X chromosome in other sequenced rodents. Okay, so basically what happened here is we took, um, we found, we got all our chromosomes, and then to figure out which one is the X, we blasted it against mouse. And we see that all the genes that are on the X chromosome in mouse are on one of our chromosomes, and we call that the X. Okay, so, so that's what we mean by the X. The, the chromosomal scaffold that is homologous to the mouse X. Okay, so, um, so the first surprise um, was that X-linked, the, the, this, this X uh, has show, uh, equal coverage in the autosomes of male, uh, sorry, has equal coverage to autosomes in males, whereas we had expected it would have half. In addition, uh, we find that ancestrally X-linked genes are found in the female genome, uh, mostly on the X chromosome. 
um, and that SRY, the actual male determining gene, uh, seems to be present in many more copies in the male genome than it is in the female genome. So what do we think is going on here? So this is what we think is uh, probably happening here. So we start with our Y chromosome and our X, and we're going to cover color genes that were in on the Y chromosome in most mammals. We're going to color, color those red. So we think the first thing that happens is that some of the that these genes um, duplicate to other chromosomes, which could explain why we see these Y-linked genes even uh, in females. And then the second thing that we think happens is that the Y chromosome actually fuses to the X, um, and so that we end up with a karyotype like this. And there should be a second. What in God's name am I doing? Oh, sorry. I, I, so this is, um, on the top we have the male karyotype and on the bottom we have the female karyotype. Okay, so um, what, uh, so our, our, what we think happened first is some of these Y-linked genes move to the X. So we see them here in this X and then we see them here in this XX individual. Uh, and that the X fuses to the Y um, so that what we call the Y, the, the, the XY pair in males, is actually an X fused to a Y, the ancestral X fused to a Y. So we call it the Y because it segregates like a Y, but in fact, its gene complement is the X plus the Y. So then, how would this evolve? So here's, so, sorry, so first thing, that would mean then that this X chromosome uh, sorry, the Y chromosome, what we've been calling the Y, we should probably call the Y X fusion, Y superscript X. And so then what that means is that the M, the modern M oregoni system works like this. And so the why might this be the case? Well, um, my hypothesis is basically what's going on. Um, our hypothesis is what's going on is that this is a response uh, to the X, to an X star like drive. So. We hypothesize that in the ancestor of M. oregoni, um, an X star system arose, a feminizing X. So if you note what happens here, basically the Y is losing out because it does not have any X. It doesn't have the essential X genes. Um, moreover, when this happens, we have female bias sex ratio, so we have selection um, for mutations that allow for a development of more males. So then, if we imagine a Y chromosome that acquired by fusion an X chromosomal allele, um, so now this individual, um, when mated, so when this individual mates, uh, now this YY individual can still survive because it still has X, uh, X linked genes. So, um, in that case, what we would have here would be sort of a classic XX, XY system. Uh, albeit with the Y fused. However, we expect there to be a problem here because um, males that carry two X's, like human males that carry two X's in a Y because of a non-disjunction event during gametogenesis that gave rise to them, um, they tend to have fertility problems, um, basically because uh, they have too many, too much expression of X-linked genes at late stages of gametogenesis. Um, and so we expect these males to have some fertility problems. So this could have driven selection for this strange um, non-disjunction event um, because this would restore one lineage of cells that has the, the proper number of X alleles, that is one copy. If we follow through then what would happen, so now this means that these individuals uh, are not transmitting the X chromosome. So now we have um, development of females with a single X chromosome. Um, these females uh, then would be giving rise to um, some eggs that are non-viable because they lack, lack essential X genes, which would then drive selection um, for the origin of this, of this strange non-disjunction in females. Um, so the final question that remains then is why do we see this in, in rodents? Why don't we see it in other mammals? So, so here's our hypothesis for this, um, that X-linked spermatogenesis genes, um, so, so not X-linked, sorry. In most mammals, there are Y-linked genes that are uh, important for spermatogenesis. So what this leads to is two things. First is fertility problems in males that don't have Y chromosomes. And the other is fertility problems in females that do have a Y chromosome. 
um, because we get ectopic expression during gametogenesis of these Y-linked spermatogenesis genes uh, who have not evolved the proper regulation under oogenesis because they've never seen oogenesis. So this means that these early steps of sex determination turnover uh, might be blocked. So that when you have a driving, a driving X allele that leads to um, sex ratio, that it's not possible for some autosomal mutation um, to give rise to a new sex determining, a new male determining locus, uh, because those males would have low fertility. I should really have a figure for that. So our hypothesis then um, is that movement of Y-linked genes to other chromosomes is an important first step um, in the evolution of these strange systems. Um, so consistent with that, we see the presence of, of ancestral Y-linked genes on the X in M. oregoni. Uh, and then one hypothesis we want to test is it's to see what's going on in Alobius. So in Alobius, there are three different karyotypes observed. The top and bottom ones, the ones I talked about. And then um, in this species, uh, we have a normal XXXY system. The Y has not been lost. And so if it's the case, uh, so, so the question then basically is why did things get weird twice independently, once here and once here, in this genus, in this tiny little group of, of mammals. And so our hypothesis then uh, would be that what happened is that these Y-linked genes moved to the X in the ancestor, which has facilitated the evolution of strangeness in these two. So uh, right now, Noel is working on sequencing um, this third allobius genome, uh, basically to just have a look at whether these uh, the Y-linked genes um, are already on non-Y chromosomes um, in this ancestor. Uh, and so here I thanked uh, the Backtrog and Wang, Wang Labs, which are places where people work on sex chromosomes that I have spent time. Um, I thought I thanked David for teaching me stuff, uh, getting me into intergenomic conflict when I was um, in grad school. Um, and then I thanked my teaching um, because, as some of you all know, we read this gene, this book, Genes in Conflict, um, which has sort of allowed me to stay close enough to these ideas um, that. I've been able to start having my own ideas um, that has allowed us to move into this field. And I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to do that because a lot of times um, people think about teaching as being, um, as detracting from research productivity in researchers, and there's a case to be made there. But this is an instance in which um, teaching has really allowed, has been really important for us to be able to, to sort of get a foothold and move into this field. Um, and then here are the people who did the specific work, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, let me turn off the video and then...